items for discussion. Our first item is the Zoning Ordinance <coughs> Modernization Project Update, project number 20PJ0107. This will be led by Ms. Chiepa, who will then introduce our consultant, Mark White. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Mr. Gillies. We're very excited to be here today to share with you um, an overview of the ZOMOD analysis report that is currently in draft form, but we have Mark White, who is our lead consultant on our project, joining us via Teams from Kansas City, Missouri. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to give the presentation about the report, and then I will be back up here with him to answer any questions that you might have. Mark? Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it. And thank you, members of the, the Planning Commission, for your time and attention today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm Mark White. Thank you for getting the state right. A lot of people say Kansas City, Kansas. Oh, I'm glad um, uh, y'all y'all knew that um, out there. So that's that's great. Um, as Rachel mentioned, we've, we've done an initial uh, a draft diagnostic of your existing zoning ordinance. It follows up on a number of meetings we had, as you're aware of, last fall, several meetings. Um, I know with at least one check-in with you all, um, our initial meetings with the advisory um, commission, which has been appointed, and um, a follow-up meeting um, that we had last week. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of a lot of great comments, a lot of great information that led into the report. So, Rachel, I can't see on Teams. Is that first slide up? Ah, there we go. Thank you. So you can go to the next one. Um, the uh, as you as you may be aware, there's a website that's been set up for the Zomod project, um, as well as a, as I mentioned, an advisory committee um, that's been appointed um, that we're meeting with to serve as a sounding board uh, for this project, as well as um, several videos now that have been produced. One just sort of a background for people who don't deal with this every single day. You know how how zoning works and in what it is, and then a second one on uh, some more details on this project and and where we're headed with it. So um, I encourage you to keep up to date with that and, and to go to that from time to time to see new documents, uh, new developments in, in the project as we go forward. Next slide. And yes, as I mentioned, there's been several, um, the videos that I mentioned are available not just from the website, but also on YouTube if you want to go there. Um, and that'll at least get you caught up on the videos that we've done um, that are designed to keep the public informed on, on where we're headed with this, with this project. Um, next slide. So um, as you may be aware, I mean, you've been through several um, updates. I know there was one about four years ago that basically did some cleanup and, and reorganizing. This one um, is looking at a more um, holistic um, and comprehensive rewrite of your entire zoning ordinance to implement your 2019 comprehensive plan. And this is a big balancing act. You know, one side, we want to implement the comprehensive plan, uh, make sure we faithfully deliver the outcomes that are talked about in your comprehensive plan policies. We want to protect existing neighborhoods. Um, a lot of concern there that, you know, they're listened to, that um, new development that occurs in the county is compatible and uh, transitions well to those neighborhoods. We want quality design outcomes in Chesterfield County. We want to protect our resources, especially water resources, steep slopes, those sorts of things, and address the the, the, the demands of future development on, on infrastructure. So those are some things we want to achieve, and that needs to we need, to, we need to balance that out with market demands for development, um, the need for economic development, and um, that, that adds jobs and quality jobs to the county, along with redevelopment of corridors that you know, have uses that are um, maybe can transition in the future to something that's more in line with, with current market demands. Uh, we need to respect the context of existing development in the county. And, you know, what. With all of that, I think one of our big challenges too, given as 
Um, given the complexity of, of state and federal law when it comes to zoning and land use control now is to try to keep um, what we're writing as simple and as accessible to the public as possible. Uh, we want people to understand what they're reading. Um, they want to know, you know, what questions to ask, for example, when they when they go to a neighborhood meeting or a public hearing or something like that and to um, feel like they they so that they know that you know what the, the ordinance is communicating accurately what's going to happen in their neighborhoods or what happens relative to their property if they want to invest in property and get through the process we also want to minimize the need for variances and we want to minimize the occurrence of non-conformities as we go forward so a lot of things to balance out as we do this zoning update next slide in our first meeting with the advisory committee, um, we asked them just a, a couple of simple questions to lead off. What, one is what they like the most about your current ordinance. Um, as you know, you've got great staff. They've done a lot of work over the years to try to keep the ordinance up to date in line with best practices, uh, not just with how you um, address zoning ordinance substantively, but how you communicate it to the public. Um, and maybe their biggest dislikes, things that, that cry out the most for fixing um, in the new ordinance. And one of the things, and we'll get to uses a little bit later, but the, the thing that came up the most was the use chart. Um, a lot of older zoning ordinances organize uses in a laundry list. It's it quite lengthy. You don't know what uses are allowed in this, you know, which district. A chart lets you just so, sort of scroll across. Uh, if you want to invest in a laundry mat, for example, you can just scroll across and see quickly what zoning districts those are allowed in and then just look at the zoning map and see if that's your property or not. And people people like that. I think it, there, there's some improvements we can make, but that was the number one thing they liked. Um, their, their, their biggest dislike was the CUPD process, the conditional use plan development. It tends to be cumbersome, um, tends to be unpredictable, and even though it has some advantages too, and we'll talk about those later, but you know, there's a sense that over the years, the ordinance has gotten confusing, um, too rigid in some places, maybe too flexible in others. And that's why we're here today, not just to implement the conference of plan to make sure, but also to make sure we have an ordinance that's in line with modern best practices and, and so forth. Next, next slide. And so our blueprint going forward um, is your 2019 conference of plan. It's your statement of long-term land use policy in Chesterfield County. It's not necessarily a legal document. It doesn't directly regulate development. It simply has um, overall broadly stated long-term planning policies that uh, need implementation through the zoning regulations and subdivision regulations and so forth. So um, everything we're doing right now looks to those long-term planning policies and those are gonna shape what those regulations end up looking like. And those policies divide themselves into a number of different categories. And we put those together in a chart, um, both an Excel spreadsheet that's referenced in the draft document that um, you're going to review and, um, and summarize those in the report. But they shake out in a, in a number of different categories. And the first two kind of go hand in hand. One is uh, calling for uh, better ways to, to process mixed use development in the county as the market is changing, market demands are changing. Um, you know, with millennials, for example, looking for different living environments and so forth, um, better ways to use, um, you know, what what becomes when you when you take it, when you take out low density or areas that are planned for low density residential development, areas that are planned for rural development. Um, looks like you got a lot, lot of land in the county, but you know that available land along your corridors and so forth gets gets more and more limited. So we want to make sure that we use that land as efficiently as, as possible. One way is to accommodate mixed use development in better ways and to pay better attention to design and to placemaking, you know, how those element different elements of a zoning ordinance work together and create a unified whole um, another thing is connectivity and that can deal not not just with streets and that's been dealt with and we'll talk also later in the presentation about that but um, also trails and, and open space and civic space networks and and so forth just so the infrastructure you have works better and more efficiently um, 
we want to look at the demands of of new development on infrastructure and and how we how we address that in the zoning process. Um, you know, creating good predictable level of service standards, for example, um, accommodating housing. Um, you know, more than just single family detached, which is the predominant product on the market today in Chesterfield County, but looking at ways to accommodate and absorb new and different types of housing to, to meet different market demands, different uh, income levels, and, and so forth. Um, how we deal with civic space, all the way from naturalized open space, like you see on the cover of the comprehensive plan, uh, natural areas, all the way up to maybe a, a more urban space, like a plaza um, that would unify a mixed-use development, and creating menus for that, so that that's something that uh, you see more of a new development, along with transitioning from some of those new neighborhoods, new mixed use developments, new commercial um, along your corridors to existing neighborhoods and, and how we deal with that. We need to get our uses up to date and the plan talks about some of those, um, some uses that have either either higher demands um, like resource extraction, making sure we have good standards in place that minimize uh, the impacts of those uses um, on surrounding areas to things like telecommunications facilities, you know, how we deal with a 5G technology um, that had, carries with it state and federal um, legislation that we need to deal with. Um, so all of those will need to be dealt with um, in the zoning ordinance as well as in, in planning policies. Uh, creating more efficient transportation networks, dealing with, again, resource protection protection in energy in new development um, from uh, riparian corridors and uh, lakeshore corridors, for example, to steep slopes, um, creating better ways to revitalize um, existing corridors in the county and how we process development. Uh, we, On the one hand, we want to make sure that we make the, the development process as efficient as possible. At the same time, we need to make sure that neighborhoods have a, an opportunity to weigh in um, as, as new development proposals are filed that affect them. Um, next slide. So there are di several different approaches to zoning, and I'm going to talk first about um, you know how we would organize new zoning districts, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the comprehensive plan and its uh, what most communities call future land use categories, your land use map categories, and how those might reshape um, zoning districts in the county. Whether that means um, realigning the standards in your existing districts or creating or, or consolidating districts in the county. So again, that begins with your comprehensive plan categories. Uh, we look at, we're going to talk about different zoning approaches as a way of organizing the conversation and then, you know, what that means for new districts. Next slide. So there are a lot of different approaches to zoning and the first two um, if you look at the columns on the top, the first two are what you see today in your current zoning ordinance, and that's um, conventional districts that divide uses by district. Um, you have three major district categories, residential, commercial, or business, and industrial. Um, and within those districts, you have uses that are permitted either by right or by conditional use. Um, and then you have, you know, basic zoning metrics um, from minimum setbacks to maximum height, maximum coverage. Um, and you have a few metrics that are a little, um, you know, a little bit advanced um, compared to uh, a lot of counties around the country. You have maximum building sizes in some of your districts that scale them um, to the context of, of surrounding neighborhoods. Um, you, in a few of the your design districts, you have maximum front setbacks and minimum frontage buildouts that try to create a better connection between buildings and streets that make them more walkable. But for the most part, it's a conventional set of what's, what planners call Euclidean zoning districts. Um, and you overlay that with um, a series of plan your, your CUPD process, where you tend to negotiate a lot of your approvals. Those approvals carry with them conditions um, or proffers uh, from development. That's consistent with Virginia law. Um, and some of that is responsive to um, the unique, the uniqueness of Virginia land use law and the proffer system. Um, but there are other ways to deliver some of those outcomes that might work better. Of course, you know, one of the, we'll talk a little bit 
in a little bit more detail in a second on um, all of these, but you know, that's probably the least predictable and the most flexible way of processing development. Um, and it's something you see of being just looking at the applications you have in front of you tonight um, that tends to dominate that CUDP, CUPD process. Um, so there's several different reactions to that that communities around the country have dealt with. And one is you probably heard a lot about form-based codes, and that's where we pay a lot less attention to the actual use of land and more att attention to design. And most form-based codes have what's called build two lines or maximum front setbacks. And uh, try to align buildings closer to streets to make them more walkable. It's something you see more often in an urban or a corridor setting than you do in, in areas that have just um, maybe single family zoning or single family neighborhoods. Um, the standards tend to be very precise, a lot of graphics and illustrations. And most form-based codes uh, feature a lot of administrative uh, approval. So most of the processes in a form-based code are done behind the counter. Um, they don't usually involve a, a lot of public hearings. And so you get the advantage of predictability. Uh, most form-based codes do a lot of, um, you know, a lot of changing um, of the language. Um, so they, they, they're, they're often not as familiar to um, people involved in, in processing development to applicants or or um, uh, citizens as as your conventional zoning ordinance. Um, another example of, uh, of an approach that de-emphasizes uses and fo focuses more on standards is performance zoning, where we focus on ratios and performance standards that minimize the impact of development on resources or the impact of development on infrastructure. So it doesn't tell you as much about the physical design outcome or what development looks like, but it does attempt to minimize the footprint of development and so you see that more often in rural environments or in places um, where we use where, where buffers and, and those sorts of things are a good way to minimize the impact of development on its surroundings. And um, what most communities who go through a process like this end up with is some mix of all of this. You know, so some of the some of what you've done in the past with conventional zoning won't go away. We'll still regulate uses. We'll still regulate them by districts. We're not going to open up all of your single family neighborhoods, for example, to commercial development. Um, I'd be surprised if the county um, if people in the counties uh, came out in droves and said, we'd like to see that happen, although we do want more of it within walking distance, perhaps. So uh, most communities end up with some hybrid of that. One example of that is composite zoning that we'll talk about a little bit later, where you uh, can identify a series of building types, a series of site design types. Some of them are distinctly suburban. Some of them are distinctly rural. Some of them are distinctly urban. Um, and you can mix and match those um, in a way that's compatible with the context of development. So it's a less urban or it's a less urban um, way of regulating development than you typically have with, with form-based code. So we'll talk a little bit more about those in, in the next slide. So uh, Rachel, you wanna to turn to the next one? So again, conventional zoning, uh, what you do today has some distinct advantages. It's the most commonly used way of regulating development, both in Virginia and anywhere else around the country. So people are familiar with how it works people who go through the development approval process, people who process development um, neighborhoods are usually fairly familiar and comfortable with the terminology if they've gotten involved uh, with zoning in the past. It's a way to make sure that uses that are inherently incompatible, for example, with a single family neighborhood don't occur um, near them or in, in a way that's incompatible uh, um, with the character of those neighborhoods. And compared sometimes to how these other systems work, it tends to be fairly simple. Um, the, some of the disadvantages are it's, it can be fairly rigid. The setbacks, building heights, the uses uh, tend to put development in a box that they often try to fight their way out of and the way to process that tends to be variance or, or CUPD. 
you don't know much. Uh, if all you know about a development is the uses that are permitted and that it has a minimum front side rear setback and a maximum height, you don't really know what's going to happen inside that box. So it doesn't tell you much about uh, the form or shape or design of development. It can also be fairly exclusionary and, um, you know, it can exclude, for example, housing that meets a, 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 a a market demand in the county and in a way that can drive up housing costs or make certain types of housing either unavailable or unaffordable to people who need them. So, um, you know, there are ways to deal with that in conventional zoning, but uh, most conventional zoning ordinances just make it harder uh, to build uh, new and different types of housing. And uh, because of all of that, it, it can be fairly limited in terms of its, um, w you know, its, its ability to to implement all the policies that are in your comprehensive plan today, because it relies mostly on uses and keeping those incompatible uses away from each other. Uh, next slide. So what traditionally most communities did to deal with those shortcomings is they used the plan unit development process or, or PUD um, to negotiate conditions uh, uh, to, to new development and ex in exchange um, new development would agree to live with you know but maybe they'll they'll proffer you um, design controls for development that you wouldn't get um, if it just occurred under a an R7 or an R9 district for example or um, it will volunteer to, to help improve roadways so can you can do uh, those types of proffers as well. Um, and in exchange, development will get relief. Uh, it may get more density. It may get uses that would otherwise, uh, that, that are otherwise not allowed in the zoning district that they're in. Um, and so you have that advantage of flexibility and you have the advantage of case-by-case -case review. So it's a public hearing. You, the planning commission is involved and makes a recommendation. The supervi the board of supervisors are, are involved. And if I live in a neighborhood that's affected by that development, I get notice of the public hearing and I get to weigh in. Um, and so those are all distinct ad advantages to the PUD process. Um, they just are. Um, the disadvantages are it's unpredictable. If I'm investing in land um, in Chesterfield County um, and I need a CUPD, um, to, to get the type of development that I need on my property. I really don't know what comes out of that black box. I negotiate with the planning staff and then I negotiate with the planning commission, with you all. I negotiate with the neighborhoods. I negotiate with the board of supervisors. Um, all, it, all along the way, people are suggesting conditions that I might uh, end up putting on my property um, as a way to, um, to get approval. And at the same, it, after all of that, I really don't know um, what that development's going to look like when it comes out of that box. It's fairly time consuming uh, to go through that approval process for applicants. Um, and it's time consuming for staff to track. It's like having thousands of different zoning ordinances as opposed to just one. So it can be kind of challenging to track and to enforce. And that unpredictability isn't just for applicants too, it's unpredictable for neighborhoods. Uh, if I live in a neighborhood, um, it's incumbent on me to show up at all those public hearings to argue my case if I don't like what that development is proposing. And I don't know if it's going to get approved or not, or what it's going to look like when it does. So um, you know, those are some di distinct disadvantages of relying on on PUD, even though it tends to have a place um, in any zoning regulation. So next slide. Um, so performance based zoning is one of the earliest it, it predates form based codes. It's an early way to try to build in uh, some predictability uh, to zoning by adding things like performance targets for impervious surface or for infrastructure level of service and so forth. So it gives you a lot of control. Um, if I'm an applicant, I know what I need to plan for. If there's a, you know, a, a 0.5 impervious service cover limit, I, I know how much of my property I can cover with buildings and, and parking and that numbers something I can plan around. Um, it can be fairly comprehensive. You can use it to control impacts on on, on environmental conditions, for example. Um, you can have impervious service limits, for example, that are targeted to 
more urban environments and some that are targeted to more rural environments and some that are that apply if you've got sensitive environmental resources. Um, so it's fairly predictable. Um, it's a it's usually a pretty effective way to deal with environmental resource protection, uh, for example, and it's a good way to control the scale of development. Things like fuller area ratio or something that a lot of communities use to make sure that uh, the size of buildings don't overwhelm their surroundings. Um, the disadvantages of form based code or performance codes are one, it tends to be complex. All of those ratios um, and all of those numbers can be fairly complicated for, for people to look at and to wrap their heads around sometimes. And that one still doesn't tell you kind of what the form and design of development's going to be. That 0.5 um, impervious surface can look like a lot of different things. It could be a big box development. It could be something that is aligned along the street nicely, but it just minimizes in the back. It maybe minimizes parking or uses low impact design or something like that. But you don't really know uh, based on that target just by looking at the number. Um, so the next system uh, that you tend to see a lot of, um, next slide, and maybe one of the biggest developments in, in the practice of, of coding um, that I've seen around the country in, in recent years is form-based codes. It, like performance zoning, it offers a lot of certainty. It tends to de-emphasize use and emphasizes design. You'll have frontage types, you'll have um, things like, like I mentioned, um, build two lines and, and so forth that um, the control, for example, the, the, the coverage um, on a front facade of, of garages um, so that a duplex, for example, that duplex on the top is from a community in Virginia uh, where we worked years ago. It's built before the, the code that we wrote, for example, um, where uh, a developer came in and, and built these duplexes and people didn't like the, the appearance of them, nor did it contribute to a walkable environment, which is what their comprehensive plan said it said that they wanted at that time. Um, almost the entire front facade is a, a garage um, or the top of the roof. Um, you, the, the entryway is not very prominent um, and the front yard is entirely paved over. So um, that bottom image, which was in a new urbanist community in, in Florida, um, also uh, one of our clients years ago, um, also a duplex. Those two uses are the exact same use, but the design is dramatically different. And the advantage you have with a form-based code um, that um, is in I think sharp contrast to what you have with zoning is the community in Virginia that I worked in when those duplexes were built and people didn't like the outcome, their remedy and what they did was in that zoning district, they just eliminated duplexes as a use. Um, so if there's a market for duplexes in your community, um, but you don't like what they look like, <laughs> You, it gives you sort of a binary choice. You either don't allow them in the district or um, or you allow them and you get an outcome that looks like that. Or you do, or you process them through PUDs. Well, the form-based code is a way to make sure that that design outcome is something more in line with what Chesterfield County is, is looking for. Um, so it's, it's fairly place friendly. Um, if you want to, um, if you want a code that focuses more on placemaking and less on dividing uses by district, this is a good approach to doing that. And a lot of growing communities have used that, especially in areas that are slated for mixed use development and for more outcomes that are more urban than what you've gotten in the past. Um, some of the disadvantage of form based codes is again, it, most of the codes use a lot of language that are unfamiliar to people. Um, things like build two lines and frontage types and all that. It can look start to look kind of complex, even with um, the graphics and images that you see in a lot of form-based codes. Um, they rely a lot on administrative processing. Um, and the theory is, once we define what this looks like, we're done with our public hearings. Our public hearings happened when we adopted the ordinance. We know what's going to come out of this black box now, um, and we don't have to um, we don't need a public hearing to process things. And so um, that is seen by a lot of people as a disadvantage. I know a lot of people may still want to weigh in on a new duplex or townhouse development or a new um, a proposal for economic development, um, even if we know what it's going to look like, because it's going to have impacts on infrastructure. It's going to have other things that happen. So 
Um, you know, those are some of the, the, the disadvantages of a form-based code. Um, next slide. So another approach to form-based codes, and you know, one of the one of the things about form-based codes too is it's often written for more urban environments, more urban settings. Most form-based codes don't deal with things like office parks or places that are still going to be suburban. You're still going to have a lot of that. Um, you're still going to have uh, places with big boxes in front-loaded parking lots. Those aren't going to go away for a while, at least. And um, form-based codes don't really tell you much about those. Uh, they tend to assume that everything's going to be urban and walkable and et cetera. When in fact, in a suburban environment, that's not going to be the predominant form of development. So composite zoning is a way to take um, the, the best of your suburban environment, the things that people like about it, and codify that with building types and site design and, and so forth. So in a suburban environment, your site design uh, would feature things, parking lots with more landscaping, for example, and landscape buffers and so forth. And your buildings might look a little bit nicer, but they don't have to be urban. Um, and uh, the same thing with urban. Your urban will look more like a form-based code and your rural will fo focus less on building design and more on minimizing the, the footprint of development. And so you can customize all of that to its environment. So that gives you the certainty that you would get with performance and form-based zoning. Uh, you can use language that people are familiar with and customize it to the context and et cetera. The disadvantage is that can be somewhat complex and it's a new, it's a new way of regulating things. Um, I often tell people the two things everybody hates are their existing zoning ordinance and anything that changes their existing zoning ordinance. So it's still going to be a way of, of relearning the process and, and th how things are happening because it's multi-layered, uh, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage, I would think. So anyway, um, next slide. Uh, we're looking at, as we go forward, using the best tools to implement Chesterfield County's comprehensive plan in all of its major land use policy areas, from rural uh, to places that are distinctly suburban and that we expect to continue being that way to places that we expect to take on more of a mixed use flavor in environment. And all of these approaches to zoning um, have advantage to each of those. So your existing single family neighborhoods may not change their regulations much, perhaps. I mean, they could remain in conventional zoning if we don't expect them to change, uh, where we allow single family detached development um, and um, we, we use a more conventional approach to that. Your more urban um, areas, your activity centers that are designated in the plan would take on a more form base or maybe even a composite zoning approach in areas that are sort of in between um, in that upper left-hand corner might have a more composite approach. Those buildings are uh, look more urban. They have better articulation than you have maybe in a conventional suburban environment. Um, there's a residential neighborhood right behind it so people can walk to that center, but it still has a lot of front loaded parking. Uh, so it's easy to park uh, that development. So we can mix and match those in places where that makes the most sense. Um, next slide. And so as we go forward and look at realigning our districts, um, the thing we're looking at um, and you know, the, the most important part of your comprehensive plan is your land use plan vision. Whereas you can see you divided the county into corridors, um, centers, activity centers, and employment areas. And most of the county um, is slated for your neighborhoods. They're mostly single family today in your rural areas. And there are different approaches uh, to lining your districts up to that. So um, the next slide, if you turn to the next slide, um, the first category relates to that rural area in the south and southwest parts of the county, which is probably, um, I think it's, if it's not, it's close to being, you know, the majority of the land area that's currently uh, shown in your comprehensive plan and in your zoning districts today. And uh, the main district to implement those agricultural land use categories today is your agricultural district that allows um, up to uh, 0.2 units per acre with a five acre lot minimum that lines up with your um, 
you know, how agricultural land is assessed, is, is assessed uh, for property tax purposes. And the priority there will be identifying uses and limiting uses those in those areas to active agricultural uses and finding ways for property owners there in places that we want to stay agricultural and places we want to stay rural um, for finding a mix of uses that implements that, but also keeps that land productive and economically viable in that form. And um, one of my clients in Virginia right now has a great name for this um, called rural economy uses. Um, so maybe crop, uh, maybe raising crops or raising livestock um, isn't as economically viable as it used to be, but having a winery or a limited brewery or something like that has an economic return to it. And so we need a pro maybe we need to uh, designate uh, that land for those uses and come up with regulations that would minimize those impacts on, on their neighbors. And so uh, that's an important issue for us going forward. The other one is areas as those areas transition um, uh, to, to more densely build out parts of the county. Uh, we've got our residential low density classification. So that's your R88, R40, and R, R25 that allow from a half to one and a half units per acre today with some requirements for open space. So the approach there is to maintain those lower densities, but also uh, maybe provide in the district some cluster or conservation subdivision options. And I know you've got a district for that today, uh, but making sure that we um, pay careful attention to the amount and type of open space that's provided, uh, maybe creating some flexibility in terms of lot size and uh, the dimensional standards for those districts so that they blend in better uh, with surrounding neighborhoods, but that they're all, but also in a way that makes them easier for applicants to use, so that we can protect the rural environment um, of those uh, of those areas is their plan. Um, next slide shows you um, the lineup of, of residential districts in the county um, today from your uh, suburban one and two, that's two, two to four units per acre, uh, where we'd have a, a mix of unit types from single family detached to townhouse and duplex, maybe with some commercial at a very low scale built in, your medium density residential, and that's your R9, R7, and your townhouse districts that range from four to eight units per acre. Um, and lined up around your corridors and centers um, within walking distance of commercial. And then your high density that can go up to eight, uh, 12 units per acre with open space and amenities, maybe some lower uh, scale commercial around them. And those are also on the edges of your centers and, and um, your commercials, but more, much more suburban in design uh, than your center residential. And those can exceed 12, 12 units per acre. They may require some new uh, districts um, or a new mixed use district where they would combine directly uh, with some commercial development uh, that's integrated functionally with that district. So it's, it's a more urban form. Uh, the setbacks would reflect that the design quality and characteristic of, of new buildings in that areas would reflect that as well, as well as some alternative residential. And um, in addition to the other districts that have things like duplexes and uh, some multifamily, things like multiplexes and et cetera, uh, what us planners like to call middle housing or missing middle housing, that's a good transition um, as it gets closer to, to single family. Looking at things like manufactured homes, uh, which are built to the HUD code. Um, that's a, a federal preemptive uh, building code, but it's also a lot more affordable um, than conventional site built single family housing. You have three districts on the books for those today, and we want to take a look at the design standards and amenities the amenity packages and so forth in those developments to see if there are better ways to, to integrate those uh, with the county. Um, next slide. The next set of districts are a commercial from your smaller scale convenience business that have a pretty tight limit on building size, 5,000 square feet that can that can fit in with either rural or, or low density residential uses uh, to your transitional districts. Also with lower scale building size, along your major corridors, shallower frontage, maybe lower intensity uses 
uh, because they tend to be closer to existing residential uh, to, to more auto-centric um, or auto-oriented commercial corridors, um, your C2, C3, and O2 um, that line on uh, your corridors that are more suburban, and where we focus more on streetscaping and landscaping to minimize their impacts. Your activity centers would be zoned for mixed use, so we're looking at alternatives to your C2, C3, O2, C4, your townhouse and multifamily development in terms of design, in terms of how um, the buildings look, in terms of how those buildings um, are integrated on the site. Um, with more attention to streetscaping, uh, reducing setbacks um, along the frontages and so forth. So we, we need something that's a more effective uh, way of processing those, uh, those developments in a mixed use um, framework. And then the final package uh, of districts would deal with um, those industrial uh, ca or employment categories in your comprehensive plan. Next slide. And those are everything from your heavy commercial uh, with more uh, what I like to call utilitarian uses that are that are retail but in, in a more intensive environment. So we we want to focus more on buffering those uh, from public view. Uh, the next slide would, or the next set would be your business park, your corporate office, and, and so forth that line up more in a, in a campus style environment. And so creating a good amenity package in the district, um, um, you know, where you get a minimum uh, uh, lineup of open space that integrates the buildings, for example, um, is something that makes sense for those districts. And then you're more, um, your more actively used employment, uh, your I-2 and your I-3 um, that are buffered uh, from residential development located further away from them. Uh, they need highway access for truck movement and so forth. And so um, we're looking at districts that would line up with those as, as well. Um, next slide. And so the first task too, and our, the, the first task in uh, getting the zoning districts up to date We'll be realigning the in getting up to date that list of permitted uses. Um, as I mentioned, your staff did a good job of of um, organizing those in a matrix format. Uh, right now, it's it's just uh, over 500 uses organized in in alphabetical order uh, today. You have a few categories um, of districts, but one of the things we want to look at. Um, and improving this and, and making it easier to read, and making it easier to find districts that are um, places where certain uses are allowed are, uh, for example, the next slide um, where we show where we line districts up by category um, instead of just putting things in alphabetical order. So under industrial, we might have a category for manufacturing and employment type uses, and then a subcategory for warehousing, storage, and distribution type uses. And um, most communities that I work in find that organizational structure easier to use, that it's easier to find uses that you're looking for and so forth. And we can even, we, we can even match the, the, the columns to the colors in the official zoning map, for example. So those yellow uh, colors, for example, are the your single family, lower uh, density districts. Your red is your commercial, um, your purple is industrial. Um, so that can match the colors in your zoning map as well uh, and make that easier to read. Uh, we also, we, we also uh, when we update the use table, we look at the North American Industrial Classification System, the APA, the American Planning Association's land-based classification system to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, but also so that we organize the uses and collapse them into categories so that it, you don't have a, a 500 page set of or, or list of, of uses in the zoning district or the zoning ordinance. Next slide. Um, it, a, another important chapter of your zoning ordinance is going to be that list of use regulations. Every that address things like cell towers that have special protections under state and federal law in addition to impacts on their neighbors and things like new uses in rural and agricultural locations like your your Virginia farm wineries, your limited breweries and things like that that also have special protections now under under um, Virginia's zoning enabling statutes, but also 
they give property owners out there uh, ways to keep that land in agricultural production. Um, they can also be used in, in ways sometimes if you have events, for example, that attract a lot of people. Um, you know, that can be, uh, that can create impacts on, on neighborhoods. So we want a good set of standards in place that minimize those. Um, but that have a reasonable package of standards associated with them so that we don't ef effectively slam the door on people who want to use the property this way. Um, next slide. It was interesting too, we, we asked um, the advisory committee, you know, whether the county needs to attract a wider range of housing types at higher densities, and it was unanimous. I mean, everybody on the committee thought that, yes, that's a goal we need to shoot for. So we need to make sure that those districts not only um, provide a complete package and portfolio of housing that the county can use, but effective ways to process them um, with design outcomes that the county expects in each of those districts. So it's going to be a variety, and it's going to be housing types that transition well from um, from your corridors in places where they make sense to your existing neighborhoods so that they fit in nicely in the county. Um, next slide. Another important chapter is going to be development standards. And these are things like your landscaping and parking and et cetera um, that apply regardless of what district you're in. So this would apply to all uses and all development. So they're going to be things like on the next slide, um, your street design standards. You know, the um, your policies talk about level of service, so that's the capacity of public streets and and um, water and sewer systems and so forth to absorb new development as it's coming in. So we need to take a look at that as well as using the infrastructure you have and infrastructure that's planned more efficiently. So uh, one way of doing that is making sure it connects well so you don't load all of your traffic at one point uh, along the frontage of development. And so one way of dealing with that is connectivity metrics and maximum block sizes and things like that. That. Something that the Virginia Department of Transportation has dealt with um, in the past, um, but ways where we can be flexible in our regulations. Like, for example, this is one in a suburban community in the Kansas City area where we added uh, pedestrian connections to that mix, which made it easier for developers there uh, to satisfy and fulfill those standards. Still have cul-de-sacs because there's usually a, a market demand for those, um, but also to build in better pedestrian connections um, uh, for new development. And that's something uh, everybody seems to like. Um, next slide. The other package of development standards is parking. And, and like most communities, you have minimum parking uh, standards in Chesterfield County because most people get around by driving and that's going to be the case in the foreseeable future. So we want to make sure there's places for people when they when they drive somewhere. It's also important uh, economically uh, for people building new development. But at the same time, do we want that to be the dominant feature of new development along the corridor? So uh, we want to right size your parking standards. So we're not asking for too much um, in the county and maybe in your activity centers, creating ways for things like uh, ways to stack parking when um, if the if the market uh, demand supports that and maybe lining those parking spaces with storefronts and that sort of thing that minimizes uh, the physical uh, impact of those and contributes to a more walking uh, walkable environment while at the same time accommodating um, uh, people arriving on site. Uh, next slide. And then right-sizing your landscaping, uh, making sure we don't ask for too much or too little, that we effectively buffer parking, we effectively buffer larger scale buildings along your suburban corridors and et cetera, and making sure that the plants and uh, that package of plants work well um, you know, for the, the local climate, and et cetera. And then finally, in your next slide, um, looking at how we deal with transitions and not just relying on buffers, but maybe um, allowing civic spaces like you see on the bottom two images. So I'm taking that picture looking um, at, the, at the center of mixed use developments from the residential portion 
in those parks and those civic spaces that only provide a glue for those developments, um, but they also buffer those more intensively built out spaces from the residential areas of the development. And so there are ways we can do that that allow developers not only to, to provide the amenities we'd like to see in new development, uh, but not uh, but to avoid double dipping, for example, landscaping and things like open and civic spaces on a on a site. So there are policies in your plan that talk about that as well, and making sure we have an amenity package um, that builds in those transitions would be a good addition um, to your zoning ordinance. Next slide. And we also want to revisit your flowcharts and revisit your processes so that they're more predictable. Uh, not all of the, the processes as they're lined out and mapped in your ordinance today give you a good sense of how they start and how they end and what it is that, that's permitted. So we want to make sure that each um, you know, each reg each process that we write has a good applicability statement, for example. So it tells you, you know, what situations trigger uh, which processes, how you get the process started, how the application is heard at a public hearing, if that's what it's required, or if it's administrative, you know, what's required there. Um, you know, what that approval means. Does it mean you can start construction? Does it mean you can go to building permit? Or is there another step you need to go for? Um, and how you keep track of that new development. So all of that will be mapped out in the same way, um, which makes it easier to read. Um, we can also create incentives, for example, um, for neighborhood meetings. Uh, so the development, even if we have administrative processes, that maybe there's ways to incentivize developers to, to, to to reach out to surrounding neighborhoods and and uh, work things out and iron things out before they they land on your doorstep. Uh, next slide. It was also um, noteworthy, I thought, with the advisory committee that was very uh, broad consensus on the committee uh, to make most of your approvals administrative, um, to make them less costly and to increase predictability. Um, there's also con some concern on the committee that we don't cut out uh, neighborhoods, that we still allow for public input and so forth. So that's something we we, we plan to balance out as, as we go forward. So your next slide, in the next slide, um, you know, maybe to tie everything up into some guiding principles for what we're looking for is um, one, creating a comprehensive framework for development in the zoning ordinance that faithfully implements a comprehensive plan. Second, to make sure that we address placemaking and deliver those outcomes that the plan talk, uh, talks about. Third, to make sure the ordinance is as easy, easy to use and understand as possible uh, through wider uh, use of images and diagrams and, and those sorts of things. Uh, Write, you know, better writing, less legalese, those sorts of things that would make it a better read for people and uh, make it easier for people to understand. Fourth, um, and we've we've done a lot of work on this so far with the listening sessions with the advisory committee, with some workshops that are coming up, is building community support, uh, listening to folks, making sure we incorporate their concerns. Um, fifth, making sure we focus on making the right things, um, the things that are described in the comprehensive plan, is even as easy to implement as possible, that we remove regulatory barriers, for example, to, to things that the county has said it wants to see happen. Um, six, making sure we incorporate best practices. Um, you know, if, some, if something is used elsewhere, um, either in the region or somewhere else in the country, um, we can incorporate that here. But at the end of the day, you know, this ordinance is writ written for Chesterfield County. Um, but we are taking a look to make sure that, you know, we incorporate the best of the best. Um, improving digital and online access. Um, I've talked before to you about the ENCODE product that's going to be codified online in a way that's easier to access with hyperlinks and calculators and, and things like that. Um, eighth, making sure we right size our standards to development that we deliver the outcomes but don't overregulate. And that's what we want to make sure we, we hit, uh, that the processes are easy to understand and that we avoid nonconformities and the need for variances as much as possible. So those are our guiding principles in writing the ordinance going forward. In the next slide, uh, we, we show the public engagement timeline. Um, we've, we're in the diagnostic phase now. Um, 
where we'll release this draft report, we'll take public comment on it, we'll listen to folks in terms of their ideas about um, what we discuss in the report. And um, uh, later this summer and into the fall, we enter the drafting phase that'll go through next year where we'll uh, release zoning drafts in modules so that people can focus um, on individual pieces of it before we tie it all together um, in the fall of 2022. Uh, where we hope to get start interfacing the public hearing and adoption phase of the process and get this all um, adopted. Um, so with that, um, next slide is just a big thank you for your attention. I know I've talked a lot. Um, and uh, with that, I'll open it up for any questions or comments from the Planning Commission. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. That is a lot, um, a lot of good information, though. So I'll ask the commissioners if you have any comments or questions at this time. Hey, Mark, this is Gib Sloan. Um, pre I appreciate your presentation, um, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm personally very excited about the process that we're going through, and I think you've laid out a very orderly process, and, um, you know, between you and Rachel and the whole team, uh, I think it started off working very effectively, and, and, and I hope it continues that way. Um, and I know I'm jumping the gun here, but my, my question for you is this. At, at some point in time, um, as a county, we will adopt a new set of ordinances. Um, and when that, when that occurs, um, and I apologize for my ignorance and not knowing the answer to this question already, uh, but when, when we adopt a new set of ordinances, will the county go through a process of either blanket rezoning um, all existing districts as they are now? Um, will we go through a process as, and I'm assuming your team is looking at each one of the zoning categories now, and as we either group them into new categories or corral them into new categories, um, how, how do we kind of juggle that, um, that, that kind of Virginia age old issue of, you know, reclassifying zoning, um, existing zoning, um, districts w without running the risk of, you know, finding ourselves down zoning somebody up zoning somebody else and, um, going through, you know, how do, how is that going to work on the back end once we've adopted an ordinance? That's a very good question, and you're right. We 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 haven't decided. The county hasn't decided how it wants to to do that at this point yet. Um, there's a variety of ways we could do that. Yes, the county could go through and just in a blanket fashion apply all the new districts, um, you know, to to everyone in the unincorporated county, and. You know, I think you know we're trying to make sure that people don't you you lose uses or lose development rights, um, even if we did that. At the same time, doing that creates a lot of concern, not only for the existing property owners because it's going to be a different mix of uses, um, and so it may look different to them, and they may not see something that's described a certain way, listed on, you know, the. Uh, the front row of the use tables, for example. So even though they don't lose the use, it it may create some initial concerns by them and for surrounding areas if it, for example, increases densities in an activity center. So, you know, there may end up being a mix of some of the districts, uh, like your single family, um, you know, could just be reclassified because they're not going to change that much. Um, and areas that aren't going to change that much, we could do that. In other areas, maybe they retain their existing zoning and we wait for people to file applications. And so, and then there's everything in between. So we haven't gotten to that point yet, but there are different ways of getting there. Um, and other communities have done this. So a lot of communities do just blanket rezone. And, you know, by the time we get through the public, outreach process. You know, there enough people have participated that they're comfortable with the new districts. We've ironed out the concerns and the community in general is fine with it. Um, but if we end up with some areas that where we just don't know, maybe we can just keep them the way they are until we until we get a, an application to rezone to a new district. So there are a lot of ways to get there and, and we'll discuss that at a later point, but it is a good question and an important one. Great. Thank you. But this is <clears throat> this is Andy. Also, um, Gib, I mean, part of this process, 
if we go through, you know, going, shifting away from, say, a Euclidean zoning or, or discretionary zoning and going towards more of a composite or hybrid style, you know, what kind of mixture of that we create is going to also affect how much blanket zoning might be necessary to be done. So we could keep some of the same categories, but then within those categories we're using, you know, performance uh, uh, zoning re um, kind of techniques to kind of control uh, future land uses, not really changing their zoning, could still keep that same category, but still would be a, a little different kind of uh, look at future development of that property. All that we're still going to have to kind of work out. So it's a good question, but I don't think we're far enough in the process just to really say it's, we we're going to use it or not. than the one we had previously. Um, and when we did that, we went from the Bs to the Cs, for example, and the Ms to the Is. So we have, have done this in the past, so I'm sure we'll be working with the county attorneys and things to figure out the best way to do that so that we don't, you know, we don't want to make people non-conforming across the board for, for sure, but we also don't want to give away, we had to give away uses, I think, when we did that last time, so we got to be careful that we don't downzone by giving them additional uses, but we don't want to give too many people too many more uses that cause a problem to those areas. So it is tricky, but I, I think uh, between Mark and County staff and the attorneys, we'll figure out a good plan for that. But we have done it before. Um, Commissioner Petrosky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mark, for the presentation and, and the work of your team and, and staff and the, the advisory committee. This is definitely exciting stuff to, to see happening. I have a, got a sort of random question about one of your earlier slides. You had, you had a slide with two buckets. It was the more and less plus and minus buckets. And as the, the resident emerging technologies nerd, I loved seeing solar on the plus side, but I think I also saw devil on the plus side, and I was wondering what that meant. You saw, I'm sorry, you saw what on the more, plus more side? devil? I think it was devil in the details. I think that was one right, of the Right, but we wanted we more of those <laughs> devilish details. Uh, uh -huh. I remember. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly which one. I had a number of slides that had those pluses and minuses. But, yeah, as Andy mentioned, um, all of those, you know, all those pluses and minuses deal with how the, the regulations are written. And, um, you know, some of those can shift columns depending on how we write them. Um, so, yeah, those were, were presented for purposes of discussion. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. The solar was, I don't have the, can't see the screen right no, now. No, the solar one's yeah. on there. And I'm, I'm excited to see the solar one. I don't know if you can see it, Mark, but they have the slide up right now. Mm -hmm. And it, okay, I can't see. Ah, there you go. Okay. Yep. And I just noticed that we want more devil. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, the devil wasn't my, that wasn't my word, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, we don't want, the devil's not a plus. I think it, 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 the, 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 the phrase got truncated, so in the details would show up somewhere else. I think that's reason, right. <laughs> Frank, I think the reason solar showed up there is because, you know, a couple years ago we made a pretty elaborate, you know, solar facility amendment to our zoning ordinance that, kind of put us ahead of the curve for a lot of jurisdictions uh, in in Chesterfield, and, I mean, in, in the whole county, I mean, the whole uh, state. But uh, I, I think that may be the reason that particular item showed up on that kind of well, Thank you, Mark word and exercise. Andy. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Mark, this is Gloria Fry. Um, I... I'm very impressed with how you use this document, the approach that you took to uh, tie the zoning ordinance and the conference plan together and to show how they could work together and should work together. So I think that it's a great tool and a good approach that you're using. One of the things that I'm really looking forward to is discussing more, getting more educated myself about the four different approaches uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued with performance-based uh, zoning. It's not something that we've that I've had much experience with, and I'd really like to learn uh, more about that in particular, in addition to the others as well. So I'm hoping that we'll have some work sessions where 
uh, you can teach us. Thank you. Certainly. Commissioner Owens. Yeah, so I'm definitely looking forward to the rewrite in hopes that some of the, the language is more simplified. Uh, if I had to say one thing that we get comments back is some people will read the section, for example, on setbacks, and they're sitting there trying to take another drink of bourbon after they read it because it's <laughs> kind of confusing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the, the you know, simplicity of that. Okay, um, I don't know that we have any more questions for for Mark at this time. Um, Ms. Chiappa, uh, one of the questions that I had of you is just to tell us what our next steps are. Great. If you could just uh, review uh, what was presented this evening, this afternoon, and um, if you have any feedback on the analysis report itself that's in the draft version, if you could get back to us probably within about a week with any changes um, suggestions that you might have, we would appreciate that, and we can finalize that up. Okay. That, that's have, have you guys sent this to us, or will you send this to us by email so we can yes, see your sir. presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? And if not, thank you both very much, and thank you for joining us thank from you. Kansas City, Missouri. Sure. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. And, and I think to follow up. Um, Ms. Fry, we'll, we'll try to work towards maybe a, a work session in July, maybe to expound upon uh, the different uh, styles or techniques for zoning that you asked for. We'll kind of continue to have that conversation. That would be very helpful. Thank you.